keeps opting to red side, they'll pretty much never get a chance at Tristana if that stays high priority. I'm we'll also have to see if Gold Queen United changes up any of the bands whatsoever as well. Callista, Caitlyn, and Thresh were game number one for Gold Queen United in the first band phase, whereas Maokai, Orianna, and Jarvin were the ones for E United. And it looks like so far, so much the same plan. And that's kind of the thing that uh, I was getting at last game a little bit uh, was that both teams ended up with two different game plans, and both of mm -hmm. them at different points executed them relatively well. So, with E United back on, on blue side here, you might see, for the most part, a run back of the two strategies, where it's, for the most part, the most mostly the same ideas. And so, already we see the Tristana first pick. GCU going for the Varus. Remember the second pick? It was Gnar, but they're going with Gragas this time. They're taking it away from Dandy, and they're getting Santor and something else in the jungle. Already changing things up a little bit. Uh, not too different in terms of what it results the overall comp being. Uh, the Gragas pick a little less scrappy uh, if they bump into each other in the jungle. Mm -hmm. uh, a little less creative that you can be with his pathing, the way that Rek'Sai can get over walls and stuff like that. But still uh, a relatively strong early game champion in terms of being able to gank the lanes, and then obviously fantastic tank in the late game. Yeah, something that Santorin is very opt to do is the fact that the body slam, much like the Rek'Sai tunnel, will be able to get him into different situations where he can, of course, cover the map and litter it with wards, which is something that Gold Coin United very much so likes doing. And interestingly enough, the, the Lulu, I understand, but the blind Poppy is confused. I mean, aside from my, my dislike for the champion, picking that while the Camille was still available, they know the Nara is available, you know, so many other options still available for Solo in the top lane to kind of go to like a more carry style top laner. They go for the tank buster in Poppy. Yeah, this is a very different uh, look than we were expecting to see as I was hyping this up as a potential run back of game one instantly nope. with that Poppy pick. You flip it on its head. Uh, it's a champion that I think is a little potentially underused in the meta right now just because I've seen it a number of times between LCS and Challenger Series, and every time I see it, it looks decent. I believe we saw Brandini playing it. We've definitely seen Licorice play it before, and uh, it is something that is very strong into a couple of the carry matchups as well as can combine well with a couple minor synergies. If you end up on a Talia pick again or something like that, you can set up a wall for the Poppy to stun into. There's some tricky stuff like that that can come out of it, as well as the fact that it just becomes very tanky very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they are going to wind up taking the Poppy, but starting to ban away some of those carry matchups that may be able to abuse it during the lane phase. The Nar gets banned away immediately by E United. So switching up their ban strategy from game number one, where there were four mid lane bans during the second ban phase. Goldcorn United, though, look like they might be doing the same exact kind of thing going for the LeBlanc ban, and can't remember the other one, but it's a Vladimir ban this time around, so still targeted to GBM, trying to limit his champion pool. Vladimir ban is a little bit surprising to me, something that I don't, you know, it's not something we see a ton in the current meta, and if you pick it into the right matchup, it can be very effective and into certain champions. Uh, I guess for GCU, the fact that their backline of Varus and Zyro that they've shown so far is relatively immobile, mm -hmm. I can see where a Vladimir pick could potentially be annoying for it, but uh, it is something that there is a lot of damage uh, or excuse me, healing reduction in the game right now with Bramble Vest having it, Varus's E has it, as well as the fact that your you know armor pen item that you end up going will usually have it. And GCU gonna go with the Cho'Gath up in the top side. A little bit of a licorice special being played right back against him. <laughs> so they're coming for a tanky, ever-growing top laner to go into the Poppy. So we'll see how Solo winds up using that in the versus Poppy matchup. Although earlier in EU, we did see that Unicorns of Love was playing Poppy in the jungle. And by locking in Shen here, as well as potentially the Galley, we might be just going for triple tanks and all in on the Tristana plan. Yeah, so this is going to be one of those very aggressive dive comps, potentially. Cycling through some GBM favorites here. Plays a good Victor, plays a Zillion, plays a Zera. Well, he plays pretty much every champion. He's had a very long career as a mid laner and a little bit of time as a backup jungler, but mostly a mid laner. Yeah, we, we, we'll gloss over that history a little bit. Uh, Cassiopeia, not bad here. Uh, relatively beefy frontline already with the Gragas and the Cho'Gath shown gonna be wanting to be able to cut through some of that. Uh, and yeah, like you said, the big thing here is the Poppy in the jungle. Shen goes top. Nice to see that there's a little bit of a flex pick there for when they show it early and uh, over the course of the five game series, if they do see that Poppy again, they have to be very concerned about where it's gonna go. But uh, it's something that we haven't seen very much just uh, with a lot of the tanks being in the jungle, when Poppy initially came out, some people were running it with Warrior Enchant, mm -hmm. and they would go very aggressive. Poppy, who could instantly kill you, 100 to 0. Uh, probably going to go the Cinder Hulk variant here, obviously. Uh, and hopefully it, it works out. It has some very potent ganks if you are near a wall, but if you're not, not much that the Poppy can do. 
It kind of seems like some of these players have kind of swapped their roles on the team. Solo picking up the Cho'Goth, whereas Licorice is the one that's playing the Shen this time around. Dandy's going to be playing something different in the jungle instead of the Gragas. We've seen him kind of not, you know, kind of go back to time and time again ever since that has been you know the strength of the junglers. Yes, and, and that Cho'Gath Shen swap that you're mentioning, we are on 715, and that was uh, when the Cho'Gath E nerfs came in a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that maybe Licorice feels like that matchup has flipped because back when everyone was picking Shen into Cho'Gath, uh, we, we weren't sure who actually wins that matchup. And Licorice, through a couple outplays, was able, able to kill Shen's, but it was always very, very scrappy. So looks like with those small nerfs, maybe he does feel like the Shen is the way to go. And we see Fly reprising his role on Syndra in the mid lane. This time around, GBM a little bit more of an aggressive pick, at least for the early stages of the lane phase in the Cassiopeia. They also pack a bit more of a punch in the later stages of the game. So they have the two kind of carry situation, whereas you have pretty much the same thing on Gold Queen United, but you also have a Cho'Gath who has pretty much an instant delete button. And so I guess you got two Syndra's for the price of one. Yeah, absolutely. And GCU, for the most part, their team comp is styled the same way. Uh, it is still focused on going for a lot of lane dominant things. They have the Varus, uh, Syndra, and Zyra all back from the first game. And they're going to try and dominate the bot half of the map. United, on the other hand, though, have a very different team comp. Not at all focused on getting a, you know, Talia roaming up to a Camille to snowball a split push here. Looks like a lot more focus on potential bot dives. They do still have that hyperscaling Tristana, so you might see some focus around that. Uh, as well as the fact that, like we were saying, with those wall stuns available to Poppy, she's not bad at invades, so maybe you might see something like that, but they don't have enough pressure in, in some of their lanes to guarantee a very aggressive Poppy playstyle. One of the things I want to uh, kind of keep our eyes peeled for is the early top lane trades, because at level one, throughout the Challenger series, we've been able to see sh uh, Cho'Gath's basically trying to fight Shen at level 1. And that was something that you specifically were keeping your eyes on. The fact that Cho'Gath starts E with the Vorpal Spikes, thinks he could outduel the Shen, but Shen just pops his Q and then deals a ton of damage back onto the Cho'Gath, and suddenly Cho'Gath's on the back foot for the early lane phase here. Licorice is the one that kind of bucked that trend by not fighting the Shen at level 1, but if, like you said here, now if you know the Cho'Gath nerds have come in, the E doesn't deal as much damage anymore, we'll see how Licorice plays this lane, and if he gets aggressive on the Cho'Gath, knowing that that's a factor. We'll have to see if, if that's going to be how it's played. As we see Zazel contesting the, the plants. He's able to step on a couple of them there. I guess they're dragon eggs at that skin. And that's dragon trainer Lulu, so he's just trying to collect more dragons. Look more aggressive. He's stomping on them. But you have to collect them somehow. Listen, you don't collect rupees in Zelda by taking the pots and just very casually holding on to them. You smash them. You don't smash the rupees. Anyways, <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, early on, the push push advantage will be going to the bot lane of GCU. Up in the top side, like you said, Solo trying to do his best to avoid any kind of auto attacks that are come in from Licorice here. Uh, not many melee champions can deal with the level one of Shen. His pull through damage when he gets the Spirit Blade through the enemy champion, his auto attacks just end up doing a massive chunk of true, uh, percent health damage. And it's very hard to contest. Let me see. Mid lane matchup between GBM and Fly. We'll see how GBM fares more in this one. Licorice in the early level two immediately wants to get into taunt onto Solo. Gets a bit of a trade back and forth, but Solo being A-OK -okay with that one. Yep. Perfectly fine for Solo. He's going to be able to regen off these creeps with his passive. And for the most part, it's going to be hanging on. You saw GBM getting aggressive in the mid lane against Fly. Was able to proc his Storm Raider Surge off a quick trade. Not going to keep chasing forward when he did it. Uh, but maybe if, you know, GBM can play this matchup very well, uh, it is a relatively skilly matchup, though it is Syndra favored. Maybe he can get some pressure back for this Poppy. And I'll have to see where the Poppy actually goes in the jungle. Dandy historically has been a little bit more of an aggressive jungler. I'm not entirely sure how aggressive the Poppy jungle can get, but as you mentioned, Gragas himself, not necessarily known as the biggest scrappy jungler. So if you don't wind up running into each other in the jungle, this may just wind up being Dandy being able to power farm until he hits a power spike where he can approach some of those angles and get through on some of those tower dives to make something happen potentially in the mid lane, but most likely around bot side of the map where Rikar and Lion are once again aggressively pushing up. It was surprising to see the Poppy pick also taken at a point in time where there wasn't a ton that it was effective against with that uh, Steadfast Presence being able to block a lot of gap closers and escapes and things like that. Uh, it can be a menace for backlines um, if you're able to get a jump onto them or to dissuade engages, but uh, there's really not too much mobility at all on the side of GCU. Only Santorin has a body slam, and that's it. So, you know, that's not going to see too much effectiveness. 
I mean, when people are immobile, it is nice for a Poppy because it makes your wall stuns more reliable. People can't gap close out of them. Uh, it also means that, you know, you're going to have an easier time getting to that back line if you ever find a flank or something. But usually you do see that Poppy taken into things with a little bit more mobility so she can try and deny it. We saw on the bottom side of the map a large chunk of damage being dealt to Deathly as Santorin makes his home in the enemy jungle. Does want to throw a barrel off the wall, but actually just finding out where Deathly and Zazel are actually going to be moving to. As Zazel and Deathly decide to attack the Krogs and try to get Santorin out of the drone jungle. But now Wyan and Rakara being able to once again push this lane into the tower. Very effective against the Shristana because your explosive charge, the splash damage makes it very difficult to deal a lot. Precisely CS underneath the tower, as we do see about a 10 CS advantage in favor of both when United, Varus, and Zyra. Very aggressive pushing available for this GCU bot lane. Santorin doing his best to capitalize on it, playing to that side of the map. Definitely, last time did fall a little bit behind in the laning phase, but wasn't the end of the world, was still able to kind of hit his power spikes. We'll have to see if that's what United goes for again this time around. Uh, where you saw Zazel opting for Sightstone and things like that before getting the upgrade to the Ancient Coin line as well as uh, the Arden Sensor. I see on the top side now both of these solo laners. Level 5, almost level 6, and I can kind of expect that's where the Cho'Goth really starts to turn this matchup around against the Shen. Having the Feast available means that, well, Shen necess can't necessarily dodge out of the Spirit's Refuge, so once again solo being very, very healthy because of his passive. He able to sustain himself up there and I wanted to take a look at this for the early lane here, but now that they kind of got into the two top lane tanks mode, it's not necessarily as impactful. Yeah, I was going to say, a pretty different storyline <laughs> from what we were looking at the last game where mm -hmm. it was Carry versus Gnar. And I mean, just the, inch, the the matchup between the two players is very uh, interesting just because Solo was kind of the guy. He's one of the gatekeepers of the NACS, always in the finals, it feels like, always on one of the top teams plays very well often as as like the kind of de facto NACS top laner. And then this year in particular, Licorice is one of the guys who's come up and really contested him and kind of said, I'm the new hotness. Everyone should be talking about me as potentially one of the better new players, but with one of the young guys in North America. And uh, after that game one performance, Solo got a solo kill a couple times, was able to force a flash kind of trying to put Licorice in his place. It feels like a little bit more of a personal battle between these two than you might see in some of the other positions in this matchup. Yeah, well, we've definitely been able to see the fact that Licorice and his rookie split was highly regarded as the best top laner in the North American Challenger Series, but it was Solo's team that wound up winning that one and then taking multiple LCS teams to a five-game series in this uh, summer promotion tournament. Now that we're in the final promotion tournament, they find each other staring at one another from across the rift of the elimination match. And E United, after squeaking through that victory there, Solo's definitely going to have a lot to prove. And I guess that does add a little bit more of a personal punch to it if he does it on a champion that Licorice is the one that busted out in the Challenger Series. Actually, Bottom side of the map, though, definitely getting aggressive. He flashes forward, doesn't exactly have the uh, Buster Shop. He does have the Stand United coming in from Licorice, and Mercara going to flash away, barely stays alive. Now Santorin coming with a flash body slam, results in first blood on the Deathly, but Dandy comes around the opposite side and answers the kill with the Poppy. Very aggressive play there. As we see, Dandy still not in a great spot, probably gonna have to go down for this one. Ends up a two for one for GCU after E United pulled the trigger on a bot lane play where they did not have that many advantages. What had happened was up in the top side uh, with the Shen being able to have double globals, he actually used his teleport to get back in the lane and pushed a massive wave into Solo, uh, who had to walk back to lane with his purchase. And during the time that Solo's under that turret CSing, uh, Licorice was almost 20 CS ahead. And so they go, well, let's make a play on the bot side where Solo has to choose between teleporting in to cover this or get the CS. And the problem was they were still brute forcing a play against a stronger bot lane who was not down any summoners, as well as the fact that Santorum was still in the area. So that play goes south. GCU covered that play. Solo clicks all his farms, does not end up teleporting down, pushes it in, and uh, already about a thousand gold lead now for GCU. So there's the big wave that they're gonna try and force this play on. Yeah, and as you saw, the flash forward from Deathly aggressively trying to position him with a, with a taunt from Shen coming in, but Rakara flashes away and Licker's not having the damage to finish him off. Not quite enough damage. Deathly was running forward for one more auto attack. That was when Santorum was able to get in range. And even though Dandy uh, was able to find that cleanup kill, a little bit of chain CC here out of GCU stops Dandy from being able to get out. He completely gives up on escaping that path and just turns back. So now two kills to one in favor of Gold Clan United. They turn around that dive, and as you mentioned, Dandy was wrapping around the backside, and it looked like that he wanted to potentially go for a tower dive, but there were no minions in position for that one, and the play had already kind of been executed at that point in time. So maybe jumping the gun, getting a little bit too excited, is the side of E-United. 
and gold coin are going to be the ones that come out ahead because of that. More importantly, though, uh, the kills have gone over onto Santorin. So it's not like they gave away a bunch of kills to the Varys or a bunch of kills to the, uh, the Zyro who can now harass that lane indefinitely on the bottom side of the map. It's going to be on Santorin who has now finished his Cinder Hulk to transition that advantage elsewhere on the map for GCU. One of the places they can potentially look at is, of course, that Cassiopeia. It does have the cleanse, so it will be a little difficult, but if you can ever land the the ultimate on Gragas back into your Syndra, you do have 100 to 0 potential. GBM did go for an early Megatron cloak, so kind of indicating he's aware of that. Santorin on Gragas will mostly be dealing magic damage, so you're building up defenses against both potential threats. As well as the fact that uh, Zyra does magic damage and the Cho'Gath. So a lot of magic damage here on GCU's team comp. Varus's execute, the percent HP damage is magic damage. So actually, atomizing magic resistance is pretty good against this team. We see, already see the Spectre's Cowl picked up for Shen on the top side of the map as well. Santorin, however, going to continue to try to exert his two-kill dominance over the Poppy in the jungle by invading aggressively on this red buff. We already have Sly shoving up the mid lane and roaming down to add support, as is Wyan, who comes around with his little dragon eggs to provide cover. And it looks like GCU will successfully steal this buff away. This is one of the things that I was going to want to keep my eye on for the Poppy was I can see a world where with aggressive laners, the Poppy can invade uh, and try and get wall stuns constantly as we see another bot lane flash forced out by Wyan coming out of the jungle after that invade. Gets it out of Zazel. Um, and like I was saying, Poppy can, can make some, some plays happen in the jungle, struggles a little bit more in ganking lanes. Uh, but if you have losing lanes like they have in the mid and bot lane where you're going to get pushed in pretty consistently, it's, you can't go for invades. And then you also have a hard time taking that fight in your own jungle because the enemy team can probably rotate first. So you see that the Poppy pick is struggling a little bit to, to find openings, but it is still early in the game and, and Poppy is a tank that scales very well. Poppy pretty much the most annoying of tanks, where it just becomes absolutely unkillable and you really can't do anything. As you mentioned, has the ability to deny engages, although the only real engage the potential they have here is Santorin body slamming in range for kind of a explosive cast, because we did see Santorin utilizing his advantage in the jungle right now to solo down that Ocean Drake. So Gokuan United is going to be taking the first dragon of the game for themselves. Yeah, GCU have more of that stand still and kill you from range, Team Tom. They have the Varus stun, Zyra root, Syndra root. Cho'Gath knock up. Lots of ways to shoot people from far away. The never move composition. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that Poppy will not find very much effectiveness with that steadfast presence. No, they do have a Shen on the side from E United, though, so they have a way to kind of gap close in the back line to try to get something done. And of course, they also kind of have a composition that isn't necessarily as fond of hard engaging either. You have the Poppy who can charge in, but and the Shen that can taunt him, but that's pretty much it. Like we mentioned before in Champions, like this composition was looking like a completely all in protect the Tristana, but now they also have the backup option if they get a lot of armor or they start getting the tanks get really, really far ahead. The Cassiopeia is kind of the backup insurance of the late game carrier from GPS. Yeah, GCU's comp does eventually feel like it's going to have a hard time fighting versus E United, even though we're talking about this Poppy pick not being particularly effective. But uh, GCU has a lot of skill shot CC. So if you're trying to lock down a Lulu sped up Tristana in some way, you might struggle to do that. And you're not super long range. And if E United are able to go into the late game relatively even with a Shen to protect the Tristana as well as that Lulu pick, you can find yourself having a very difficult time getting to her in team fights. You need one of those CCs to land, then maybe you can get the CC follow up. But like I said, all of it is skill shots. So Gold Coin United, the team that was touted for their team fighting prowess, may have their hands full a little bit if this game decides to go long, which is kind of what they enjoy doing. They do and usually thrive around the later game team fight centric kind of play style. But now they find themselves once again in the early game here of game number two of this best of five. About 1,000 gold in the lead. Most of that is going to be on Santorin as he has both of those kills. And you can see about 700 gold over the opposing player of Dandy and Poppy. There's a little bit of a lead in the mid lane here for Fly, as well as on the bottom side of the map, Rakara. It's 130 to, compared to 103 CS advantage showing on the Varus. Yeah, better games out of Rakara here today, this time also on the Varus as opposed to Tristana, mm -hmm. showing that he can win this matchup when he's on the favored side. The thing is, though, he was always kind of touted as having good hyperscaling play. Yep. One of the highest KDAs coming in from the Challenger Series, and that, of course, is on the picks like the Kog'Maw we saw in the Challenger Series Finals against United, where I believe he was 12-1 and one at one point in time. So Rakar's late-game carry is definitely strong, but we'll see how he can push these advantages on Varus. He already has gotten lane phase advantages in both games one and game number two. The unfortunate uh, Baron steal in game number one, however, kind of thwarted all of GCU's built-up advantages. Whoa. Now, Fly going toe-to-toe -to -toe with GBM in the middle, and the cleanse was popped on the paralyzing gaze, but now GBM got the best of some, but Santorin flash body slams in. 
Teleport's being channeled from Solo as well. Explosive Cast tries to lock GBM against the wall, but Shen standing at it will save him. Both top laners have joined the fray, and nobody's going to die today. Almost a sick ultimate there out of Santorum. Predicted the flash and threw it back there, but the angle was not quite right. And like you said, pins GBM up, up against the wall as opposed to delivering it to the Cho'Gath to potentially get a feast off. Uh, either way, very intelligent play out of Santorum, and just not able to find the perfect angle for it to work. Uh, and all that was kicked off from an aggressive trade out of GBM, able to open up onto that center. And that's what I was saying, a bit of a skilly matchup that can go uh, Cassio's way, though not necessarily favored in it. Yeah, and interestingly enough, we see the Abyssal Mask Rush coming out from GBM. So he's turned that Negatron Cloak on over to an item that not only gives him resistances, but will also give him a little bit more magic penetration. So while he's still stacking up that tier, taking aggressive trades because of those Twin Fang bonuses, just stacking down on top of the Syndrome. I'll be uh, a little, keep my eye on this build as it progresses because you would think uh, a Banshee's Veil would be the something, mm -hmm. the, the item that you would turn that Negatron Cloak into early. There's, like we said, a lot of skill shot CC that this would give you a little bit of a buffer against. Instead, it goes for the Abyssal Mask, and there's not a ton of magic damage on the side of E United that's going to get amplified with it. Cassiopeia will be able to make good use of it, but uh, overall, it's just something that does not feel like necessarily the best single item MR that you can get when you're against this team comp with GCU. Uh, and Maybe you go with the Banshee's Veil as well, because like we said, GCU is so magic damage heavy. And that's why I, I want to see exactly what GBM is going to finish this build off with. And don't forget the Abyssal Mask and the uh, Banshee's Veil kind of swapped roles a little bit earlier on when we kind of had the mid lane, uh, mid lane mage kind of item snafu that happened. So now the Abyssal Mask, technically the more defensive of the items, even though the Banshee's Veil still has the ability to block out the spell. The Banshee's Veil is the one that actually has the itemization so, or the ability power on the item. So meaning if you go for both, it's still a very viable option because it's not like he's stopping building damage to get two defensive items in a composition. Right, but at the same time, you are spending at that point so much gold just on magic resist mm -hmm. when you could be working on a higher DPS item is, is just the question that comes because Cassio is one of those champions that Hyperscales, like we said, can build six full items. Uh, and if, yeah, if you use your boots spot instead on a Banshee's Veil, that makes sense to me. But if, if, if it's your first two items or it's your first three items, is that going to be quite enough damage to melt through a Cho'Gath or something like that? Well, that's kind of one of those delayed item power spikes we saw coming up in the bottom lane here of the United. As we do see Tristana getting body slammed on, but able to leap away from that one. As the Ardent Sensor was rushed this game by Zazel, as opposed to waiting for the two item power spike of the Tristana. They went for Ardent Sensor and Static Shiv at the same time, instead of finishing IE first. But Goldcoin United don't really care about their items. Instead have just gone and taken actually the first tower of the game, 16 and a half minutes in. Yeah, nice uh, movement down there by GCU. They have really good vision control in the bot side jungle. Fly, able to get the push on GBM and get the first move out down to that bot side. Still a little scary to go for just because you are down that global to Shen. Uh, and that's why you see United right now posturing around this dragon. We see Solo's Cho'Gath making the long trek down from top lane. We see definitely having to Tristana hop over the wall as GBM puts out the Paralyzing Gaze. Wants it locking down on the fly. Does not yet have the cleanse available. And Dandy's able to slam him down for a kill. Another one follows as Wyan goes down. Rakara has to try to flash over the wall as United find a fight. This is one of the things that GBM does so well. I mean, we, we talked about last game criticizing him a little bit for having uh, some greed in him. But he's also a great playmaker. He finds his way into a brush that GCU has no idea that he's in there. Starts things off with a big stun. Dandy follows up on that very well. Licorice as well, trying to get that taunt off. They were actually knocked up during it, so he just went underneath them with the taunt. <laughs> uh, but still, great uh, combination of skills there. And here you see GBM just hiding in that brush. Santorin gets a little aggressive. People continue to walk forward. Gets the stun up onto Fly, who's one of the strongest members on the GCU team comp right now. Instantly deleted. And there you see that, that potential backline dive on the immobile carries that can come through with that Poppy and Shen. Yeah, so very, very good combination of the frontline tanks. Just kind of combining to be a bit of a Bash Bros composition as GPM was the one that started that fight off. And while Goku and United were able to take down the first tower of the game, it is United who respond immediately. A flash body slam on GPM though. He cleanses out from the stun immediately from Syndra. Can't really cleanse off death though as the Untelish power takes down GBM. Oh, uh, it's one of those plays where GBM is recalling in the middle of the lane instead of just walking back a little bit more. Santorin sees him from the side brush. Knows the flash is still on cooldown, so he gets his own flash body slam off and serves him up for Fly to get the answer kill. And now GC are setting up a siege in the mid lane, trying to get their second turret of the game. Goldcoin cool United say we may have lost the fight, but we're not going to turn the tempo down at all. Instead, decide to siege up this mid lane. United have zero tower. Goldcoin cool United now have find themselves at two. Good play by GCU answering back. Both these guys trading blow for blow right now. 
GC grabs the turret. United tries to punish with the global advantage on the dragon. So, uh, Solo was roaming down for that, but the play happened just a little bit too fast. Not able to get involved. United win that team fight. Now Solo wants to finish up on this top side. This team is working on the rift hill. They can try and get over to Solo to help him out if they feel like he's in any danger. But that's a very big Cho'Gath and a not very strong Tristana quite yet. Nah, yeah, only has a BF sword and a bunch of magic damage coming out from the static shift. Dandy being zoned away by flies on Syndra as Santorin's gonna be able to pick up the eye of the Carol. He's going to wind up having the rift hill for the second time in a row. And we'll see if Gold Coin United now. That top lane tower is already super low. I'd be surprised if they used the Rift Child to take that one down and instead try to actually threaten an inner tower with that instead. Yeah, we'll have to see what they try and do. They could uh, use it later on in the game. Right now, Dandy, there's some of that chain CC that we're talking about. Uh, Shen is working down on the bot side by himself. United were able to send him down there while GCU focused on that Rift Herald. So they're down a little bit of tempo right now. You see all of them trying to get these resets off while United pushes aggressively into the top half of the map while Licorice takes her down the bot side. Yeah, so United find themselves with their first tower of the game off the back of a Licorice split push. This time around, he's not on the Camille, but he has gone for a Titanic Hydra first on the Shen. So. Yeah, pretty important to try and grab that to just match with the uh, Cho'Gath natural damage can come through with his uh, spells. And so good item to keep that pressure up in the side lane. It definitely gets a little low. Chain of Corruption goes a little bit wide and definitely is able to jump out of that one and dodge it out. But the Ardent Sensor and the Lulu Shield and the Whimsy for a bit of an attack speed boost as well. As we see Zazel four levels in that one. So actually maxing that first to give definitely as much attack speed as possible. On hit damage coming out from the Ardent Sensor and on hit healing as well. So the faster you attack, the more damage and the more healing you get. Good combination of that on the Lulu, and instead, it's also combined to deal a lot of damage to this tower. We're definitely actually able to just attack without Hubers, kind of, and just sit up there and wail away on the tower, even though Rakar and Lion are kind of throwing skill shots his way. One of the things we were saying, as long as that Tristana has the speed buff, kind of hard to land those skill shots. You see, he's not too worried around this turret, uh, as well as the fact that his team had done a decent job walking in there, getting some vision. Zazel still does not have his sight stone completed, so it is a little darker up on the top side of the map than you would want it to be when you're making this kind of aggressive push. Uh, but he should be able to grab that soon enough. Interestingly enough, too, uh, one of the teams that we've seen in the NALCS do this was Echo Fox. And when they did go for that very fast Ardent Sensor and delayed the sight stone, everybody stayed on the yellow warding tree in order to compensate for the fact that they didn't have the sight stone wards. Whereas E United at this point in time has gone for double sweeper and has upgraded to the scrying orb as well. So not necessarily as much vision for them to keep themselves safe, but they're more about vision denial in that area. And as you can see from the side, of Gold Coin United. They have a couple of control wards over in the Baron Pit area. However, their wards do not extend past the river. So while United may not have the Sight Stone available, they're still doing a good job of trying to keep GCU as much in the dark as they are. Doing their best, but GCU is a team that is pretty relentless with their vision. You see battles going on in the river right now. They had great vision down the bot side that, that prompted that kind of uh, skirmish mm -hmm. that happened down there. Eventually, United will come online. Uh, Zazel does upgrade, so he has wards now ready to throw them down, heading into the river to do so. Oh, I have the Oasis, too. It's just like not content to go back when he has Sightstone, just gets the extra 250 gold and upgrades it. So now the vision control may be more on the United side. But more importantly, the fact that they've been able to kind of hold GCU to not getting complete vision dominance while not having a Sightstone, uh -oh. actually, GBM. Speaking of not having vision, might have to be uh, a little bit careful. Your flash is like gets the Shen standard as well. Pops the cleanse too. So actually, we're gonna see Licorice saving the life of this mid laner as both these teams kind of posturing the fight in the mid lane, but Gold Coin United after that gank attempt does not want to follow through on a full 5v5 team fight. And a little scary there, you see Solo was able to find a good flank roaming up from the bot side. Just Righteous Glories right at GBM. Almost would have been able to get that kill, but Santorin, once again, explosive cast, not quite on point. Not GBM further away, and then the rest of the United, as we saw, were already on their way down to that mid lane and are able to back up GBM. GCU at least has the Righteous Glory team synergy on point. Both of them popping at the same exact time. And Rift Herald summoned in base because that was about to expire. So Santorin channels that one in order to get the Herald. It looks like we'll be marching down onto the top side. Might want to get that very low HP top lane outer tower after all. Might be able to finish that one off, but unfortunately, if no one else is around, no global gold. Uh, Rift Herald's taking a very long stroll. Actually, it walks pretty fast. I'm actually yeah. surprised. Faster than most champions are, base movement speed probably. Oh, finds the GBM though. I don't think GBM's gonna be. Oh, GBM runs away. 
Both going United are doing the dragon at the same exact time, though, so they're using this as a distraction herald. Yeah, still is United with no vision down the bot side. GBM was scared of the Rift Herald, thought there was going to be friends behind it. Not at all, they're all on the dragon. He will actually finish off that Rift Herald by himself now. Rift Herald accomplishes nothing, unfortunately. Does clear a minion wave. He does. Poor Herald. All it wanted to do was go for a wall. GBM didn't want it there. The world's not fair. As we see Licorice getting really far forward. Has no idea he's walking into a trap, potentially. No, actually, the blue buff still is able to wind up going over to Fly. But he's a very tanky Shen. Level 15 at this point. Full Spirit Visage, Titanic Hydra, and Merc Treads. He's fighting two primarily magic damage dealing champions, so... He'll be content to take that fight pretty much almost any time. And he was able to buy space for GBM on the top side of the map. He's able to take down an outer tower for the side of United. And brings the gold lead back in their favor this time around. It's kind of what happened in game one. GCU with that Sentra pick makes some strong plays. They kind of get a lead for themselves. United start answering back a little bit once the turrets start dropping and then find themselves in the gold lead. The question is, GCU with that single Mountain Dragon this time around. Are they actually going to be able to force a Baron or something like that correctly? They also have the Cho'Gath extra secure to make sure that they really do get that if they go for it. Well, the gold advantage is right now from EU United. Now that they have the lead, a lot of it is going to wind up being on the top lane matchup here. The Shen over the Cho'Gath by about 1,500 gold. So huge advantages for Licorice on this side, as well as a couple hundred gold in favor of Deathly and Zazel, which I now expect to ever so slightly increase more and more and more. The fact that Zazel and De uh, Deathly have kind of hit the two item power spike. So they have the wards, they have the Ardent Sensor, and they have the IE and the Static Ship. And that's when things start to turn a little bit sour for the Wave Clear fight. It's actually Dandy flashing in aggressively, gets the stun against the wall on the fly. He actually popped the clench in that one. Chain of Crushing goes wide. Paralyzing Gaze goes up from GBM. He's kind of all by himself because the Cho'Gath in his back line. He's fighting Santorin on one side. Licorice is thrown away on the other, and they knock Cho'Gath completely away as Deathly's going to get the first kill on the Y and hopping forward, trying to get the reset. Double kill picked up for Deathly, he's gonna leap forward on the fly, scatters the weak backwards, but the Tristana is strong! A triple kill for Deathly! Once again, EU United fighting on their power spikes. He's got the IE static shift combination. They also have the Ardent Sensor online. Definitely not focused very much in that fight. And GBM lived for so long that Abyssal Mask paying off that extra bit of defense available. Solo is in range potentially to get the steal. Ooh. Really nice blast cone usage out of Licorice there. Such intelligent play out of E United secures them that Baron. They blast code him to the far side, or excuse me, they use the Tristana ultimate to knock him to the far side of the blast cone. Then Licorice taunts over and auto attacks the blast cone to knock himself back while also knocking Solo away. That was one of the smoothest Baron secures I think I've seen in a little while now, especially when compared to what we saw in the last. <laughs> I was gonna say the last Baron secure I saw was a Tristana static shift crit stealing it away by hitting a Zyra, but still EU netted come out on top of that fight. Aggressive engage by Dandy to start that one off as well. We were wondering what the jungle poppy was going to bring to the table and the fact that they don't have necessarily a very good way to kind of engage a fight and start things off. But when you have a flash poppy stun against the wall, I guess that's how you do it. Oh yeah, I mean, United's engage was always uh, fine for the most part. The, the, if they ever find an angle for Dandy on an immobile backline, that's not that bad. The question was, would it be enough? As Dandy Ooh. here gets knocked into the team, blown up. They say, what if you find an angle on an immobile Dandy? He wants it going down. Yeah, that's the thing is uh, GCU still has a ton of CC available. If they're able to find it onto any member, they can finish them off quite quickly. Dandy there working by himself for vision. A little bit ahead of the rest of his team gets picked off as GCU was waiting in the jungle for him. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the thing is, you know, we talk about GCU's immobile backline. If you can get to them, great. Um, they're going to have a hard time locking down Deathly, and that's kind of what happened in that team fight was uh, Solo was on the backside trying to do something to Deathly, and he was mostly getting ignored. GBM was not focused down quickly enough in the front side. The CC also not locking him down well enough. And uh, they won that fight. They got the Baron. They lose Dandy, but they're keeping the pressure up around mid lane. So one Baron buff has fallen, and one of their tanks is no longer available. Now it's respawn on the map, but they see Licorice that's pushed down the top lane towers. He's got an inner tower already, and they're looking for the last outer tower in the mid lane here. The rest of EU United have grouped up for this one. Although Rakara and Wyan have some decent wave clear, the Baron buff minions are more resistant to that magic damage that Zyra, Syndra, Cho'Gath, and everybody pretty much on Gold Coin United side is going to be providing. So it's really the Rakara show now for wave clear duty. He can only be in so many places. Up there. Only can. Right now he's in the mid lane. Shen pushing up the top side. 
United, uh, they have the pressure. Licorice can potentially look for a flank by cutting through the jungle. Not much vision control up there. Wouldn't mind seeing something like that. Um, Lulu running back all the way to escort the minion wave. The rest of the team going to push as fast as they can. Pretty cute play out of E United using the Baron buff, increased movement speed on the minion wave to get it to the turrets quicker. There it goes. They get the last outer tower on the map for Gold Point United. So. Utilizing this Baron buff for at least two towers. It might be looking to pressure in for another one. You see Licorice wrapping around from the top side of the map. Definitely, though, got stunned up and takes a little bit of damage, but he's still got the Ardent Sensor Lulu on his side, so he's going to be able to lifesteal off of some minions. Actually, walks over towards the jungle, life steals off of maybe a blue buff steal here, as well as a rotation down from E United onto the bottom side of the map. That was Dandy leading the charge. He's the only one that doesn't have the Baron buff. Yeah, so sadly enough. Syndra gets there in just enough time to wind up putting an orb down and putting a stop to the minions, which is very impressive. And there you see definitely Ooh. the sidestep that stun sent out by Fly. He's trying to predict, definitely running forward to hit the turret. Definitely understands that, baits out the stun. GBM, not as effective damage. at dodging a uh, skill shot, <laughs> takes a lot of damage. Gets rooted up by Y and it actually threw the Miasma down onto Santorin. So he wants to get a couple of tower shots to the face for his troubles. Now E United stalling out ever so slightly, although they've already gotten two towers with their Baron Buster. So it's not the worst thing in the world. A flash away there from Zazel, getting him out of rupture range. But Dandy's waiting in the brush, as is Deftly. He's going to try to start this one off. Wyan gets charged on by Poppy. Now uh -oh. Licorice and Poppy are in the fray, and Deftly has to try to run away from Fly. Fly wind up popping the untapped power, but did not get the kill onto Deftly's Tristana. Too many shields. One. The GCU got a little fortunate there. Wyan got very, very low. Could have been dropped, but United lost track of where Fly was. Definitely kited right into him. Ooh, the Infernal Drake spawned at the same time, so they were able to knock that one down. And now Solo taking a lot of damage from GBM, and Deftly's joined the fight as well. Zazel's gonna get uh, stunned back a little bit by Fly, but now they've gotten themselves an Infernal Drake. The Baron buff has fallen off, but there's low health bars on GCU, so they have to back away. Yeah, United, despite the fact that Deftly got a little low there, he does have the ability with that Warrior's uh, mastery to be able to Lifesteal back up, he's fine. They also have the Ocean Dragon ticking, so they can continue to force down onto that Infernal Dragon. They grab that one pretty freely after that small skirmish up near the mid lane. 3,800 gold on the nose, Baron power play. So E United had a slight advantage when they won that Baron fight, and now find themselves with basically a 6,500 gold advantage after coming full force and taking down a couple of towers, winning... Winning a team fight by pick, not necessarily even picking up kills, but just by forcing Gold Coin United back and taking another second win condition. The fact that they have an Infernal Drake is only going to increase the damage that GBM and definitely can provide. Yeah, and that's the thing is they already are probably going to outscale into the late game. You throw that Infernal Dragon on, it becomes a nightmare scenario for GCU. They need to find pickoffs somehow onto the key damage dealers of E United, but as long as they're playing safe, they, they have no easy way of doing that. That's one of the, the key things about someone like a Maokai or something, mm -hmm. is that it is guaranteed lockdown CC. If I flash WU, yes, you might be able to pull me out a little bit, but at the end of the day, I will be able to get you. And here you see how easy it is for E United to kite out that Righteous Glory sped up engage by GCU. We saw the steadfast presence from Danny coming to hand, but an immediate flash engage down onto Wyatt. Definitely picks up the first kill of the fight. Now he's jumping into the back line, gets stunned up by Santorin, but he's going to climb off that stun. Paralyzed and Gaze goes out. GBM gets knocked forward to continue chasing down onto Santorin, who will not die. Stays alive because of the smite on the Raptor camp. They picked up one, and that's pretty much it. Bit of a uh, different team fight there where Dandy actually ulted uh, Fly and Solo out of the fight, uh, which means there's less targets to focus down in some sense. So they tried to go onto Santorin, who's able to get uh, protected as Solo and Fly make their way back in that fight. Either way, a one for zero and pressure still for E United here. Going to continue to push, grabbing their second inner turret of the game. And we see Deathly's crits already packing quite a punch, forcing Fly away from his own tower. And almost wave going in just one or two hits right there. So Deathly, though, has to be a little bit careful. Kind of all by himself. He has Zazel recalling not that far behind, but they're not Zai and Rakan. They can't team up to tag team that, but United now coming out to massive gold advantage and being able to find these fights with these flash dandy engages. A yeah, great look there. It's only onto the support, not necessarily a key target. Fly and Solo end up over the wall, so they go down onto Santorin. They almost get him down low, but a nice stun onto Dandy and definitely stops any more damage from coming through. They have to be happy with just that single kill. Baron's not up to force around that. 
That's coming up now. And so GCU is up in the river trying to get some vision control to stop E United from being able to force this down easily. Yeah, and they need to control vision of this area because if E United takes another Baron buff, the split push from Licorice has been brutal for Gold Coin United to deal with. And the fact that now E United are at the point where they are winning all of these team fights means that a Baron buff can pretty much end the game if you are E United. So Gold Coin United, I mean, Rushing it down would be kind of a desperation play, but that's not how Gold Coin United plays. They usually want to go in for a control play. Definitely, though, getting caught out! Pops the cleanse and everything, but he just gets soloed up by Fly. That is a huge catch for GCU. That's exactly what GCU needed. We were saying they need to find a pick onto a priority damage dealer of the United's comp. They get definitely in the mid lane. They're going to try and push this for as much as they can. They start this Baron off. They have the Mountain Dragon, and it looks like E-United has no plans of contesting this. They have the Vision. They've killed the carry, and E-United are nowhere nearby this one. Gold Coin United are going to secure themselves the Baron, and that's the kind of calculated play you expect, but that's not the kind of mistake you expect definitely of all players to make. Uh, he's usually considered such a safe carry in here. It's nice that E-United makes a big rotation down to this bot side, but the Baron Empowered Recalls means there's no hope for this to turn into a legitimate push. And GCU are going to start trying to siege up now. We talk about how good their comp can be if people are stuck underneath their turrets and will like shoot fish in a barrel as they try and wave clear your Baron Empowered Creeps. This could be an opportunity here for GCU to find their way back in the game. They just need to be concerned of the potential engaged to come in from Dandy and Licorice. One of the things that Gold Coin United can do now is, you mentioned the have a composition is extremely good at sieging. They're really good at pushing waves up too with the Varus and the Syndra. Their composition, their play style is basically, we enjoy stalling things out until we feel comfortable taking objectives and taking fights. The Baron buff, they can utilize this to push up every single wave. The Elder Dragon's going to be available in about a minute, and that's going to be equally as effective for both of these teams. More uh, specifically, amplifying the one Mountain Dragon that GCU has means that they can utilize the Elder their dragon and the remaining Baron buff to push down into the base of United. So we already saw them fainting down towards the river area, the bottom side of the map, putting down some preliminary vision control. Now they just need to make sure that they can push up these waves and contest that area. Let's see if they're able to do that. You see Solo up on the top side getting his push onto Licorice. Still has that Titanic Hydra, so it can kind of clear the wave, but it's going to struggle to do so. That is the third of the game for GCU. Looks like they're using this Baron buff to potentially posture up near the Elder Dragon as well. Not getting too aggressive near these turrets. I would have liked to have seen them get a little more aggressive, try and get the gold lead closer in their favor. And we'll see if they wind up utilizing the Baron buff afterwards. The Baron buff will be, if they take Elder Dragon as quickly as it spawns, Baron buff will still have a little bit over a minute left before they're actually able to, before they actually runs out. So they can utilize that as a double neutral objective buffed up push. And as I said before, both these teams have two ele elemental drakes apiece, so it'll be equally as effective as far as the burn and the aspect of the dragon goes. Speaking of burn, Zeke's Convergence picked up there by Zazel. Ooh. Haven't seen that too often, but he grabs it. Uh, gonna be able to do that uh, whenever he uses his ultimate, summons a little frost storm to help burn down targets. Uh, meanwhile, we'll think about that later. GCO started off this Elder Dragon. Yeah, to burn down a target of their own, that's the Elder Dragon. Dandy trying to get, find a flank. He's too far forward. There's wards there. He has no idea that GCU sees him coming the whole way. He's trying to set up a flank for his team, but he just gets jumped on and dies instantly. And with that, they have the Cho'Gath easily able to secure that. Slicker's trying to find something in return, but can't take that turret. Mm, that's what we were talking about before. Gold Coin United, if they have vision control of an area, if they feel confident and they get a pick or they get some sort of advantage, they will pull the trigger on going for that. So now they have about 30 seconds left on the Baron buff. They have the Elder Dragon burn, which is not only going to help them in a teamfight situation, they already have a ton of poke damage and kind of siege potential damage, but now it's also going to be amplifying the effects of taking down these remaining towers. And they only have three this game. There's still eight left on the map that they can take. There's a lot of gold available for GCU, as well as all that global gold that you get from these neutral objectives. Baron buff will time out soon, so they will have a hard time getting a double buff push. Uh, but if they can land some of that skill shot CC, get that burn down, it's, it's you know not negligible, and they do have a ton of pokes. They have an easy way of applying some of these uh, damage over time spells onto E United as they're trying to hold underneath their turrets. They have a little bit of decent back, so I think Rikara was waiting until he was able to complete it, getting a additional BF sword into his build. So a bit of extra damage means that all that poke damage and all that dragon burn will only be amplified more. We see now Gold Coin United trying to posture themselves into a 
one-four-one split push scenario. It's solo on the top side of the map going toe-to-toe -to -toe against Licorice, and the Gold Queen United establishing vision control between the top and mid lane areas, They're trying to rotate back and forth between the two and see which one they can actually knock down. Seems like neither of them has dandy tries to start off on the Santorin there. Gragas is pretty fat, but sometimes even he can't be stunned against the corner of the wall there. But it is definitely in the mid lane by himself. Ooh. We saw how that went uh, a couple minutes ago. It's kind of the catalyst for GCU getting back in the game. Has to be careful, but looks like GCU is going to be able to grab this turret. Taking a lot of damage to Santor in the front line, but he's also taking up that tower in just enough time for Wyan to deliver the last hit on that one. Rakar now actually trying to go for a red buff. Flash forward by GVM. The petrifying gaze will not wind up stunning Rakara. Instead, just turns around at the last second. We are able to get the red buff down on the Deathloop. That's a flash and an ultimate down from GBN. Yeah, not a great trade of objectives there. I would much rather have a flash on a Cassiopeia than a red buff on my Tristana. You could uh, bring the flash from Makara. Although... Yeah, it was it was a nice trade of flashes. Uh, and the, the concern is just that you have to find a way to get onto Rakara, and that can be kind of difficult to do. He has the QSS down, and so if it's just a Shen Taunt, he gets out of that. Poppy needs to hit an ER combo to stop him in place for a little while. Uh, but Unite has done a good job finding their engages when they're actually all grouped up. But as soon as one thing goes wrong, uh, it's it's impossible for them to find the right look. The the Elder Dragon fight, Dandy tries wrapping around, jumped on right away. They completely abandon that team fight. Definitely dies early. Completely abandoned contesting the Baron. And so Gold Coin United have kind of gotten themselves a little bit of respite in this game as they put the pause button on E United. They're actually able only to take one tower off of that double buffed up neutral objective push. Elder Dragon Baron has fallen off. Baron is long gone, and in fact, Baron will be spawning again on the Rift in about a minute and 20 seconds. Goldcoin United haven't been able to transition the vision they had on the bottom side back up into the top side. Those who United already have a couple of control wards around the area and have secured the Scuttle Crab vision. So we'll see if E United is the one that wants to try to pull the trigger on that. They also have a very fast Baron taking team. They have a super buffed up Tristana because of the Lulu, but more importantly, they have GB on. GBM on this late game Cassiopeia who could just hit like a truck on there. Yeah, that's the thing. We see he has not ended up going with that Banshee's Veil. Said we're going to try and keep our eye on that. Uh, did not want to invest that much into MR early. Uh, is going for a much more damage focused build now. Going to finish off that Zanyas pretty soon. And then the question is, what does your sixth item become? Do you go for something like a Death Cap to really maximize your DPS? Do you go for that Banshee's Veil to maximize your uh, ability to stay alive in a fight? We'll need to see because, uh, for the most part, GPM has done a good job of not going down early in fights. So. Mm -hmm. It's only that once so far. You see now, Gold Point United. Once again, in the 4-1 kind of scenario, but they have Dandy wrapped around the backside. This could potentially be good or bad. Dandy was the one that went down in that Elder Dragon test, which is the catalyst that GCU needed to take that one. Dandy instead being forced away by Santorin. Definitely a little bit far forward. He's going to get wrapped around on by Solo, but dodge it on the rupture. and. Ooh, status shift crit. It drops everyone's health bars a little bit. Dandy, I like the idea of finding these flank engages, but it feels like you might be overforcing just a little bit. Mm. It ends up with Licorice in the split push, and then because Dandy's flanked off on the side, you only have a three-man chorus. He runs forward, tries to get right onto Rakara. He flashes in, jumps onto Rakara, and delivers Licorice in the back line, but Solo was trying to chomp down on the GBM. The feast has been used, but... Cassiopeia and Tristana take him down. Poppy's actually fallen in the pit, but the Baron is acting as a sixth man in this fight. Definitely leaps forward, flashes forward, gets a kill on the fly. Rakar is able to pick up a kill on the backside, but now it's the Deathly Show. Triple kill picked up, double kill picked up. Shen gets that one. There's the triple kill for Deathly. I got too excited, and that's an ace for E United. And they're able to meet up with the minion wave up in the top side. Licorice has already got this turret pretty low. E United might be able to end the game off this push. A great engage by Dandy onto Rakara kind of forced him to a pit and they're trading damage onto frontline members as Licorice had ulted on top of him. But that's perfect for E United's comp because they do so much more damage to GCU's frontline. So even though he has the Gargoyle Stone Plate pop, Solo goes down first. GBM ends up dying as well, but definitely is left untargeted in that fight. He's able to run wild and win the game for his team. They put a lot of eggs in the Deathly basket, and even though he got caught out one time mid lane, he didn't disappoint in the end. E United are the ones that jump out to a 2-0 series lead, bucking the trend of all of our Challenger Series finals, where they fall down to Gold Coin yet at 3-1. And on top of that, GCU, if they have any hopes to come back into this tournament, they have to reverse sweep, something that they attempted to do just yesterday, but came up a little short. So Goldcorn United now had their backs against the wall, but Zazel and Deathly 
in that game specifically, we're combining to do a lot of work for the side of EU Knight. I mean, we had our questions around like when the Arden Center timing and is it going to work out? And even though they were behind in lane and Mercara and Wyan were kind of, you know, they were up in CS, they had pressure, they were able to get kills on the bottom side. And there were a couple of snafus like the tower dive early on at level six or seven where Dandy wound up going down and they gave up two kills. They were still able to come out ahead in that one and on a seven, two and three Tristana. I mean, that's the thing is... You know, GCU does play a little slow. That's one of the things we've always said about them. And E United is basically saying, okay, well, we'll just take better late game carries with uh, the Tristana. The Talia, not, you know, significantly better mm -hmm. than the uh, Syndra, but still a very high damage uh, DPM champion who's able to just consistently pelt front lines down. And so as a result, you know, they just go into these games. They get a little scrappy. Both teams are not executing perfectly. But as the game goes later and later, that does still favor E United. Yeah, and we saw E United were being able to handle themselves a lot better in these late games to like kind of team fight situations. Game number one, they did wind up having a bit of a lucky Baron steal, whereas game number two, they were pretty much in control from the 20 minute mark onward. They got themselves a decent gold advantage because of the licorice split push, but they didn't necessarily play around the fact that Shen was the strong one. They were able to transition that into a lead for the rest of the team. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is you're not always going to play around just whoever your strongest is. Sometimes you play around your weaker member and try and make sure that they, they stay relevant over the course of the game. And that's a little bit what's going on here with the Tristana pick. They're not over focusing. Oh, Shen's kind of winning his matchup. Let's just keep forcing plays down around that bot side. Yeah, so we already got two games down in this best of five series. So now let's check in with the analysts to see what they make out of that second United win. Thank you very much, Tom and Mark. And here it is, e United finding their first two wins of the whole yeah. promotion tournament. And they do it yet again on another Tristana game by Defley. And against a team that they have really kind of struggled against historically you know, in these big series. And they lost them in the finals. They lost them last year. They always seem to lose to GCU, but they're playing very well today. All right, let's take a look at that last replay there of the ace that happened at Baron. Because this one just closed it out right here. And during the fight, you were saying you had a good point about the front lines. Yeah, I mean, it's just simply talking about the fact that GCU at this point cannot really match up in a front to back fight against E United. You're playing against a Cassiopeia and a Tristana. They have outscaled you. They're so much stronger in the 5v5. And really, a lot of what I felt this game came down to is simply the kind of draft that you go for. And, and Kobe talked about it, you know, on the other stream. He's talking about the fact that, yes, you can pull off split push type comps. You can do them, but they're much more difficult to execute. You have a time limit kind of running on you because you're playing into a Casio and a Tristana. And once they get to that point, it's almost impossible to win a 5v5 without a, a tremendous mistake or an incredible play coming out from the other team. So for me, it's, it comes more down to the fact that GCU did not push the pace, did not actually execute on a level to where they could close out the game early enough because once you get to that six item point it's there's almost something you can do yeah and actually the team that was pushing the pace here was e united they went with a three to four man bot lane dive and it ended up not going well because gc was able to turn around and pick up two kills here if we roll that replay at 7 30 there it is yeah it was it was a bit of a botched dive <laughs> a, a bit ambitious perhaps and i mean they are very close if this was a level six Tristana, could have buster shot back and, and certainly secured that kill, but barely the Varus is able to survive. Dandy decides to go in, Surprise. does take him out. It is a trade of kills there, but First Blood had already gone over to GCU. And then here, I'm not really sure what Dandy is thinking. With both members out of Mana, I think he actually could have just walked out, uh, but perhaps worried about, you know, as you suggested, a mid lane roam coming down, giving over a kill later, or maybe looking for an angle to pin the Zyra against the wall and try to kill him, but just walking too close to the turret. Either way, not the best dive, but... <laughs> Uh, that comes out okay. Yeah, I'm poppy. I'm pretty tanky. I'm a world champion dandy, but unfortunately <laughs> that kind of doesn't carry over into this game. And then the game slowed down. It started playing into E United's hands. Definitely had enough time to scale up, get the items that he needed, and was able to pop off in the first Baron fight that led to a triple kill and Baron heading on over to his team. I mean, they just have such a strong 5v5 team fight. A really nice engage on this fight by dandy, finding the pin on the wall. Uh, you essentially have two massive frontliners with Shen and the Poppy. Then you have Lulu to support your two hyper carries. So as long as Deathly and GBM are safe, you're going to be successful in these fights. And definitely credit over to Dandy for finding some really good ultimates to disrupt the fights and knock people out. There were multiple ones throughout the game that he had, you know, knocking multiple members out and really kind of separating the fight, allowing them to very easily just pincer down on one side and, and to clean up the team fight. So if you're the side of Goldcoin United, you fought tooth and nail, slugfest with Phoenix One. You showed some mm -hmm. resilience and you showed that, hey, we belong here. 
Now you're down 0-2 against your nemesis. What do you have to do to get yourself back in the game? Well, we've seen that they can actually bounce back from this. They almost reverse swept P1, right? So it's certainly a situation that they were in before, and they are going to be able to have the confidence that they know they can come back. They have the ability to do that. But I think it really just comes down to if you're going to allow the other team to draft for super late game scaling, then you have to either draft late game scaling to match that <laughs> or you have to be willing to actually make plays and push the pace to win the game early because those are the two options. If you play you know, an inferior late game comp and you're letting the game go late, you're playing passively, you're almost always gonna lose. And in the Challenger series, Fly was able to move around, make plays and step up, especially in the finals. He went toe to toe with GBM, was able to win that matchup. Here though, he hasn't been able to quite do that. So what, what do you wanna see out of him? I mean, I think it just, once again, it comes down to what kind of composition are you running? If you're running an inferior late game composition, you need to be proactive. We want to see him making those plays, moving around the map, you know, getting active, because that has been a big criticism of GCU. The fact that while they are a pretty strong late game comp, they often kind of just wait around and are not actually proactive. They wait for the opportunities to come to them. And, and if the other team is, is playing hyperscaling and you're just going to sit back and, and play passively, well, you're probably going to lose. All right, on the side of E United, you've been so close twice. You lost in the tournament last year. Here you are. You have the opportunity to move to that final promotion tournament game to get yourself over the hump. What do they need to do to put the nail in the coffin? I think it's more of the same, right? The things have been looking pretty good. Draft to your strengths. If, if United wants to play slow, keep drafting, scaling, keep playing for those uh, opportunities in late game. And I, and I think that as long as they're getting comfort picks for Dandy, I think that Dandy has been a guy to make to make plays who is the uh, player who's going to look for those openings to start off team fights, and I think putting him on someone who can initiate, who can start things up, uh, it has been very successful. And so you've given two options here. You've given, if they're playing late, we're going to go later, or we're going to do what Gold Coin United tried to do earlier. Mm -hmm. We're going to pick early and make those plays. Which one is easier for the teams to execute here in the, in the I mean, final team, team fight comps are so much easier to run, I think. Split pushing is, is massively harder. That's why these kind of death ball compositions are so powerful, because it's such a simple win condition. All right, well, you farm. You try to avoid not fighting. Now you have all your items. You go five people together, and you shoot the person in front of you, right? <laughs> it's pretty simple to actually execute. Split push comps can tear those apart, uh, and you can... Uh, execute on those, they can be really, really powerful, but it requires a lot of coordination, it requires a lot of uh, proper map movements, vision control to actually enable those top laners, which are generally part of the split push plan, so it's, it's a lot harder to pull off, and that's why I tend to think that especially at levels like this, the team fight compositions are superior. So Gold Coin United just got word that Gold Coin United is going to be subbing in Mad Life, and you know, Mad Life and uh, Wyan have both played the Thresh, kind mm -hmm. of had that support champion pool. Are there any big differences that you think will happen uh, now that GCU subbing in Mad Life? I mean, one thing you're kind of hoping is that Mad Life has been watching the game with the coaching staff, right? And that he has an idea of what is going wrong, that he can actually bring that into the game, that he can execute on their game plan, he can look to make plays and, and try to capitalize on some of the weaknesses that he may have seen from their opponents. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and take a step away, but stay tuned in for more of this series between E United and Gold Coin United. Don't touch that browser.